Today, BSSC2, and welcome to our third online sync for our Asian studies. Um, again, this is our third online sync for the entire term. And before I forget, we still have papers to submit um, up until week five. So for those who have not submitted yet your papers, just please um, email it to me so I'll be able to find time to check it. Okay. Um, also, uh, this week, I may upload your week seven and week eight module, so just uh, keep yourselves uh, posted and just submit that um, output before the end of the term, okay? Just like before. Um, also, you have your um, final outputs, I mean, your, your projects, so um, try to check with the syllabus that I provided to you and go over and, and verify it, all right? Okay, so again, uh, this is our third online sync for our East Asian studies, I mean Asian studies, and we will be talking about East Asia, um, especially with the country's development. Now, what I provided to you with the module are basically the basic things that you must learn from the countries who belong to East Asia, all right? But what we are going to discuss now are things that uh, wasn't given that much emphasis on the module because of its limitations okay so that's what we're going to discuss um everything that you have read from the module these are the basic things that you must um, learn uh, especially uh, that um, some most of it will be uh, part of of the exam of course and eventually uh, when the time comes that you will take your that exam um, those are important informations that you can use and remember uh, for you to answer your major exam okay all right so without further ado let me um present my screen so we can start right. okay so let me share to you my screen now and let me open it with full screen All right, so again, just like what I introduced to you earlier, we are going to talk about East Asia, but not everything that we have, that I have um, placed in your module um, have been included. So what we are going to talk about now are things that are very important that wasn't able to get, uh, wasn't able to, um, that I wasn't able to get or give an emphasis in your module, okay? All right. So these are the learning objectives of our discussion. So we have to explain how East Asian economies have been increasing their share of global economy and identify the causes of territorial disputes in the South China Sea, summarize the remaining tensions between North and South Korea and how the two countries have developed over time. Okay. All right, so let's talk about how East Asia um, started their their booming economy um, and also started to, to put an emphasis of the global economy all right so the rising economies of east asia now east asia is a home of some of the world's most prosperous economies while southeast asia witnessed the growth of some of the world's fastest growing emerging economies with favorable political legal environments for industry and commerce, abundant natural resources, and adaptable labor determined to be the main factors of success. Again, um, the rise of East Asian economies have influenced other regions, especially the South Asian, I mean, Southeast Asian um, economies, right? Or, of course, no? Um, Southeast Asia was able to, to create a, a fundamental organization, which we call now as ASEAN, in order to strengthen um economic partnership within the region but they patterned most of this um economic development from the, the development of the east asian countries led probably by china uh, as of today uh, led by china but before it started by japan right of all the 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 economic um, prosperity that have enjoyed by by the asians um japan has led um, this economic uh, miracle, all right? 
So again, what were the, the factors that causes the emergence of this economic um, growth and development? Well, they have favorable political legal environments. That would mean that they have people inside working the government who have uh, this sense of nationalism where they focus more on saving their country, developing their country, and providing their country the necessary means in order for them not just to, to, to survive and start over again from the war, but also tries to separate themselves from the rubble of the war, right? By doing so, they have to invest um, in their people, right? So investing to the right people led the economy of uh, East Asian countries um, surmount challenges that they have been struggling for quite some time, especially right after World War II, okay? So by crafting laws, by crafting policies, which would help their industry and commerce, especially with international trade partnership, um, Japan, China, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau. Um, these are some of, of the countries and in, in, in regions in, in China who have developed um, when it comes to their economy. It's because they have adapted properly and followed properly. Um, the rules and regulations or the laws that was crafted by their country. And at the same time, um, they have an abundant natural resources, right? Though they have um, some, uh, they have limited natural resources because of their, of their environment, but uh, they were able to utilize it properly. That's why they still have abundant natural resources. But one of the best elements that they have is what we call the labor force, right? Again, they have adaptable labor force, which uh, focuses more on, on the increasing of productivity, right? If you don't have that rich and abundant natural resources, or you're still struggling to utilize what um, resources you have in your country, right? But the people who have uh, the right knowledge, the right expertise, the right skills can transform your country to a better place. So even without proper technology, even without um, so much resources that you have in your country, as long as you have the people who are willing to work and to sacrifice for the sake of the country, then you will achieve um, you know, the, the, the economy that you wanted to achieve. And we are actually experiencing this uh, when we look at the economies of Japan, China, South Korea, so on and so forth. Because these are the countries who have struggled after World War II. And we're still struggling at that time when they have civil conflicts, right? Except for Japan, but with China, between the nationalists and the communists, between South Korea and the North Korea um, factions. So these are some of the problems that they have met right after World War II. But then after resolving some of the problems inside their country, they were able to prosper. That is because their people have been following uh, correct and in, in proper um, guidelines coming from the government. All right. So this is just the background on how um, the economies of East Asia have rose, have risen, and so have risen from from the rubbles of World War II. All right. Okay. Now. Um, East Asian Renaissance. This was actually coined or termed by the World Bank when Japan and the rest of the Southeast I mean, East Asian countries have developed in a very short span of time. That's why uh, many would consider it as an economic miracle because they have shifted you know, from really nothing to a very powerful and dominant economic um, country. I mean, dominant when we talk about um, the economy of each countries, right? All right, so let's talk about the economy of East Asia. It's one of the most successful regional economies of the world. The changes that turned the area into an economic power began with the Meiji Restoration in the late 19th century, when Japan rapidly transformed into an only industrial power outside Europe and United States. Um, the good part about the Meiji Restoration is that um, the emperor and in the government of Japan has allowed um, their people to accept influences coming from the West. Though they don't have much of 
um, resistance or much of a choice because uh, at some point they were forced to open it. But then they use this kind of situation into their favor, right? So they did not so they did not kept on revolting and going against what is happening around the world, but it, instead uh, they were very accepting on the changes. And what happened was um, they accepted the changes, but they did not um, forget their country. Um, so what they did is they tried to um, use every knowledge, every information that they have acquired from their experiences coming from the West or you know, from the education that they have received from the West, and then use it to develop their own country. The fact is, before World War II, Japan became one of the superpowers, right? And we know that uh, from history. So um, Japan's early industrial economy reached its height during World War II, and its eventual defeat in war slowed down the economic development for a relatively short period of time. Japan's economy recovered already in the 1950s, and by the 1980s, the country was the world's second largest economy. Can you imagine? Um, they have accepted defeat in 1945 when uh, Japan was bombed with a, a nuclear bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? You still remember. After that, Japan crumbled, especially their economy. But just a span of at least five to ten years, they were able to stand back again and became one of the superpowers. Why? Again, they have learned from the past. And from to move forward, they have to make sure that the things that brought them down to their knees in the past shouldn't um, come back and should be a learning curve from the people of Japan. Okay, So it is a fact that when we don't forget what happened in the past, we can utilize all of those knowledge and use it into our own advantage in the present to the future. Okay? Imagine... At least five to ten years, they were able to reach one of the highest um, economic growth right after World War II. And again, one of the largest economy in the 1980s. Okay. Now, other East Asian countries followed their own reforms and resulting economic miracles. And today, East Asia is home of some of the world's largest and most prosperous economies, including mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea. So no need for introduction for these countries, right? And, and some of the places of China. It's because if you will look at it, you know, if you search um, over the internet, you'll be able to see um, the, the prosperity of these countries, okay? Um, however, again, um, they were able to reach this prosperity when they tried to learn what happened in the past and use it into their advantage, okay? Now, the major growth factors have ranged from, again, political and legal environments for industry and commerce, through abundant natural resources to plentiful supplies of relative low cost, skilled, and adaptable labor. Local populations have rapidly adjusted to the requirements of new technologies and scientific discoveries, while also demonstrating exceptional work ethics. The region's economic success has led the World Bank to dub it as the East Asian Renaissance. Again, Renaissance in French means Rebirth, right? So after all the rubbles of world war, um, East Asian countries have been um, trying to find a way to go back from where it, you know, from, from its glory. And they were able to successfully do it um, because they have strong foundations from their government, right? When they followed properly what is mandated by the law, their cut land, then they were able to achieve it, right? So the people is the key when we talk about successes, um, especially with with the economic prosperity that we want them. Okay, so it's the people. As long as people have this this idea that um, your wealth should be distributed um, equally to the other people, so that other people also can live um, the life that they wanted, then I think everybody. Can, can achieve that if we are working together, right? Um, in 1998, when we have the, the Asian crisis, uh, what South Korean uh, people did is very admirable. Um, the government actually asked 
every single one of them to donate cash, um, to donate property, to donate um, other wealth that can be transformed into money. Because um, their economy is crashing down and it's not even their fault because it's just, you know, the ripple effect from what really happened when there was a recession um, um, in, in our in our continent. But um, South Korean people actually thought that if they work together, they will be able to achieve um, and change the path of South Korea. So they were expecting that their economy will be in the loose end by the start of 2000. But then in 1998, um, people gathered to, to government assigned places to donate everything that they can donate, right? So from earrings, jewelries, everything that they can donate to the government. And then the government was able to reach at least one initial money, one billion uh, US dollars for them to start and, 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 and reboot their country. And surprisingly, they were expecting to at least um, bounce back for about um, 10 years after that crisis, but they were able to reach it maybe at least just five years. So um, South Korean people were very good in trying to change the path that they were used to. They got afford not to cooperate to one another because they're in constant threat also with North Korea, where most of the money of North Korea are are used in in militarization. So by that, um, South Korean and, and South Korea as a whole were able to achieve its economic prosperity once again after the Asian crisis. And look at South Korea now. They're one of the best countries who have higher um, um, higher economy uh, compared to other Asian nations, right? Okay. Now, major growth factors have ranged from favorable political and legal environments for industry and commerce. Through abundant natural resources and plentiful supplies of relatively low cost skilled, just like what I said, right? Um, uh, again, um, if you take a look from the, the, the work ethics of these countries, they are more on in concern on uh, on developing one another than establishing um, you know, separation. So that I think is one of, of the best characters that we can learn from these countries, especially when we talk about the Japanese culture, the South Korean culture, and even the Chinese culture. Well, though Chinese has a very strict policies because they are under communist rule, but still the people there were able to achieve uh, the height of their their um, prosperity. It's because they work hand in hand to have achieved um, economic growth that can be enjoyed by everybody, you know, equally. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next slide, let's talk about each of the countries and how they develop, and what are some of the challenges that they are facing, and, and some solutions that we may be able to to know here that we can probably use it in our own advantage as, as people who are close or neighbors to these um, countries okay so let's talk first about japan now in the three decades of economic development following 1960 japan ignored defense spending in favor of economic growth thus allowing for a rapid economic growth referred to as the japanese post-war economic miracle with um, average growth rates of 10 percent in 1960s five in the 70s and four in the 80s Japan was able to establish and maintain itself as the world's second largest economy from 1978 to, until 2010, when it was surpassed by the People's Republic of China. So can you imagine, um, Japan became one of the richest country in the world. It's because they have um, fine solutions um, coming out from war, right? So prior to World War II, most of their money, most of the government spending are basically I'm going to the military because they wanted to make sure that their country has a lot of defense and can probably go on on an offense right and when we did actually witness and understand um the history how the japan became one of the superpowers and tried to colonize um most of the asian countries right and the philippines is one of the victims of of the terror of the Japanese Empire at that time. But after which, after they learned their lesson from the, the rebels of World War, um, 
they 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 shifted from spending more um, in 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 economy than of defense. And look at what Japan um, reached now, right? But of course, um, right after 2010, China became one of, of you know the best and super. Uh, power when we talk about uh, their economy and they have led up until today uh, they have the world's largest economy okay all right so the economy of japan is the third largest in the world by nominal gdp the fourth largest by the purchasing power party and the world's second largest developed country japan is the world's third largest automobile manufacturing country has the large electronics goods um, industry and is often ranked among the world's most innovative countries, leading several measures of global patent filing. So Japan did not stop from from becoming very efficient in its development, right? Um, as you've noticed, Japan has the most patented filings of all of the inventions and innovations that they have. If you go to Japan, well, you will be surprised of all the the automotives, uh, robotics, and all of the the, the innovations that they have reached so far, um, you know, from time immemorial that they were able to, to reach this height, okay? Um, facing increasing competition from China and South Korea, manufacturing in Japan today focuses primarily on high-tech and precision goods, such as optical instruments, hybrid vehicles, and robotics, okay? Um, Japan is the world's largest um, predator nation. So they have actually um, lend uh, money from from World Bank, from Asian Development Bank, and IMF. But they are also one of 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 the best creditors because they are paying their debt uh, properly. That's why they kept on developing because they are using properly the money that they have loaned from um, these uh, international funds uh, funding institutions, and also they were able to reach and help other nations by its own development. And the Philippines is one of the recipients of, of Japan's benevolence, right? So we have been, uh, been one of, of Japan's um, benefactor when we talk about, um, you know, um, getting loans from them. But they have this kind of, of agreement with the Philippine government that the money shouldn't be put into uh, the, 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 the hands of the few people. But part of the contract is that the money should be transformed into infrastructure, all right? And they will be um, checking the development that the Japanese have loaned for the, the Philippines. So um, we have a lot of, of, of infrastructure development, uh, which is supervised by the Japanese people. And that's good, right? Um, I think one of the railways that um, the Philippines under the this, this current administration um, is funded by the Japanese people. So we loaned money from them, but they wanted to make sure that the money would go waste. So what they did is they basically uh, monitor the development of the infrastructure. And I think the railway is one of, of the projects coming from Japan. Okay. All right. Now, Japan's economic challenges. So we've known how Japan have I mean, surpassed all the challenges after World War II and started developing um, right after five to 10 years only and then became a superpower uh, when we talk about the economy in the 1980s. And um, until today, they are actually reaching its plateau, meaning they are at the peak of their, their success and may not be um, really that affected when we, well, well, the world might be affected with some of the recessions, right? But there are still challenges that we need to address when we talk about Japan's economic challenges. One of which is this. Now, the Japanese economy faces considerable challenges posed by dramatically declining population. Um, statistics showed an official decline for the first time in 2015, while projections suggest that it will continue to fall from 127 million down to below 100 million by the middle of the 21st century. Now again, you have to remember this declining population now one of the key factors why japan's economy has you know boosted from from the very beginning it's because of the people you know the people 
um, have this work ethics that um, showed emphasis on saving the country's, um, I mean, economic depressions and recessions, right? Um, however, as time goes by, people are getting more into sus suspending or or just delaying, um, you know, getting a, a family or, or having children of, it, of their own. Um, and this is quite alarming for the Japanese economy because they are one of the countries in the world who have the fastest um, aging population. Uh, their, their production will be affected if they don't have people to work with the industries anymore. And they have very strict rule when we talk about um, job opportunities. Okay, but um, last uh, year or two years ago, the Japanese government has issued an, an announcement that they are trying to change the the um, foreign policies, especially for workers coming from abroad, um, that would help their economy. So they are giving working visas to to other nations to work with them in order to to at least um, fill out the gaps from from the declining populations because there are no workers anymore right so the philippines is one of the of again you know one of the japan's benefactors when we talk about um, the changes of of the work opportunities or job opportunities so they are giving the filipinos at least four years to get work visas and after which they are allowing us to stay there okay and, and that that's good news for the filipinos because it, it means more job and it means that it could help our gross national income if we are um, giving or we are be, we are you know given opportunities to work abroad, right? But again, let's not take the fact that Japanese people do have problems with with this kind of situation. As long as the, the Japanese um, skip having a family of their own, then that's going to be a problem, especially in in, in the near future, all right? Um, another thing, the, the pandemic um, has caused a lot of trouble in the Japanese um, um, society, in the Japanese population. They have reached at least the highest number of suicide rates ever in their country. And that means that it's causing, again, a steer in their economy because people are, you know, um, getting um, out of place. Uh, mentally, and, and that's why their their government has is, issued an uh, announcement that they might be creating a ministry for mental health. This is to help the general population um, solving problems, especially with regards to mental health concerns. Okay, um, it's a step forward for the Japanese society in order to address this kind of problem. It's very concerning because it would not just affect no uh, the, the people. Or, or, or the family of those uh, victims of suicides, but the entire population as a whole. Again, uh, we are Asians and we're collectivists by nature, and we do give um, better emphasis on cooperation than in the individualism, okay? Now, aside from declining populations, one of the, the, the challenges of this country, we also have a bit physical challenges, right? Now, Japan is mountainous, volcanic island country. Japan has inadequate natural resources to support its growing economy and large population and therefore exports um, goods in which it has comparative advantage such as engineering oriented research and development led industrial products in exchange for the import of raw materials and petroleum. Now in order for them again to, to fill out what they are lacking in their country they have to find another avenue for them to to get um, as much as resources that they wanted to get, right? So um, they have quite a problem when we talk about um, raw materials, especially they don't have much of the resources where agriculture can really suffice the need internally. So what they can do is to exchange their produced products, especially engineering-oriented products, um, research-oriented products, and development-led industrial products in exchange for another raw materials, right? Um, the most important part is for the economy to work is petroleum, okay? So they need that in order for their country to, um, to work uh, and to improve and to continue to, to be excellent in their, in their, in their chosen 
um, economic fields, right? Now, Japan also has among the three importers of agricultural products in the world, next to the European Union and United States, a total volume of covering of its own domestic agricultural consumption. Again, um, Japan is an island nation, doesn't really have much of, of of a place where they can um, grow um, sufficient agricultural products. And like some of the countries um, lying in the middle of the um, equator, like the Philippines, do have a lot of lands that can be tilled on and plant with, right? However, the Japanese country doesn't have that. So what they do have are the people and some of their raw materials that they can um, use um, to develop um, another materials like, you know, engineering oriented products, okay? All right. Now we've done understanding how Japan has established uh, their country as one of the superpower in the economy. Uh, we've also known that they are facing quite a lot of challenges or quite challenges, you know, in their country in order for them to continue its development. Um, from that, uh, the Philippines and the rest of the Southeast Asian nation have understood the value of the people, the value of how um, to to, to prioritize things that needed to be prioritized with, okay? Now, let's talk about China, all right? One of the superpowers in Asia as well and have led a um, couple of years now to be the, 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 the country who have the largest economy, okay? Now, China is a socialist market. Um, economy is the world's largest economy by nominal GDP, the world's largest economy by the PPP according to the IMF. Although China's National Bureau of Statistics rejects this claim. But again, right now they have led um, the world as the largest um, economy in, in the planet. Okay. Now, until 2015, China was the world's fastest growing major economy. The growth rates averaging 10% over 30 years. Due to historical and political facts of China's developing um, economy, China's the Republic sector accounts for it, excuse me, for a bigger share of national economy than the burgeoning private sector. Now, let me emphasize that the country followed the communistic government, meaning the state run the country. And that would mean that everything that you do there is subject for the, the, the state's approval. So even though you are a millionaire or a billionaire, again, the country or the, the state has a lot of rights to intervene with your um, transactions or to your business as a whole, okay? Um, you've heard about the news about Jack Ma, right? That allegedly, Jack Ma has been held in one of the facilities of the Chinese government uh, for whatever reason, we don't know yet, but this is very common for the Chinese government, uh, especially with the billionaires, millionaires, um, to, be, to be checked properly by the state. Okay, um, again, nobody's above the state in a communist government, especially with regards to China. Um, though the intention of the, the government is to really help um, the country to reach and achieve um, equitable equitable um, life and to have a better life, everybody should work hand in hand. And that's the goal. So, right. Now, China is a global hub for manufacturing and is the largest manufacturing economy in the world as well as the largest exporter of the goods in the world. It is also the world's fastest growing consumer market and second largest importer of goods in the world. It is a net importer of services, products, and the largest trading nation in the world, playing the most important role in international trade. Um, like the Philippines, our biggest international trade partner is actually China. That's why, um, well, we will be talking about the, the concern with the South China Sea, but during the time where we, uh, we insisted on claiming the, uh, the Spratly Islands and some of the parts where uh, China you know, has acquired from us, uh, the Chinese government just issued um, several um, sanctions, um, especially when it comes to importing products from the Philippines, right? Um, if you have seen before that they boycotted our um, um, products like the bananas, they boycotted and they just trash it away. And, and that's one thing that we should be learning 
from the China's um, policies with regards to to having conflict with its political uh, plans, right? Um, since we're a little country, uh, doesn't really have much of power to, to to be aggressive on our claim, then what we can do um, so far, what we have been doing with China is to have bilateral talks, um, to have cooperative um, meetings with them on, on how to solve problems with regards to the South China Sea conflict, okay? And as of this very moment, we have very little success in imposing our own right. That's why we have been losing some of our gross domestic products, especially from, from the fisheries who have been affected by the China's um, occupation in our seas. Okay. Um, to continue, um, however, Western media have criticized China for unfair trade practices, including artificial currency, devaluation, intellectual property theft, uh, protectionism, and local favoritism due to one party oligopoly by the Communist Party of China and its socialist market economy. Again, there's no perfect form of government and there is no perfect uh, form of market economy. All right, these are just people working on what they believe should be right. But we can still see loopholes, we can still see uh, problems within this kind of systems because um, these are just, you know, human run systems. All right, so. Um, we can still see that even though the promotion of equality in a country uh, should be a priority, but uh, there are a lot of criticisms from, from, from this point of view, right? Um, again, these are just um, very um, unfortunate that right now, uh, the countries who have been claiming uh, parts of the South China Sea could not really impose anything at all because, you know, aside from the fact that China has established their own um, artificial island which we can see from you know sky view that it's quite very military structure and that would mean that that artificial island is not for commercial or any um, business related um, opportunities but could perhaps be an outpost um, as as a um, you know as a defense system by the Chinese government. We don't know, right? Okay, moving on. Now, China's unequal transportation system combined with important differences in the availability of natural and human resources and in industrial infrastructure has produced significant variations in the regional economies of China. Just like what I said, uh, though China has developed um, its economy and really were able to achieve uh, the height of their economic boom. However, the distribution of wealth in these countries still um, sees an equal or an equality, right? Or inequality, sorry, inequality. Um, as you can see, most developed provinces or regions in China are actually near to the, the waters who have good ports or the rivers that can support their agricultural economy. However, those regions doesn't really much have something to offer for the entire government has been still struggling from the efforts of of the government so that's why um, we can't really have this kind of of this kind of um, success um, of equality it's because um, again there are places who could not provide or wasn't um, given priority by the government okay now economic development has generally been more rapid in coastal provinces than in interior interior and there are large disparities in per capita income between regions like what i said this is the problem right um the distribution of wealth in this country don't really have um, an equal treatment right if you belong to those places who doesn't really have much to offer, then they are probably, you know, getting low um, um, per capita income. And that's quite of a problem when we talk about equality as part of the platform of the government. Now, three wealthiest regions are along the southeast coast. It is the rapid development of these areas that is expected to have the most significant effect of the Asian regional economy as a whole, and Chinese government policy is designed to remove 
the obstacles to accelerate growth in the wealthier regions. One of the hallmarks of China's socialist economy was its promise to, of employment to all able and willing to work in job security with virtually lifelong tenure. Reformers targeted the labor market as unproductive because industries were frequently overstaffed to fulfill socialist goals in job security, reduce workers' incentive to work. Uh, this socialist policy was uh, pejoratively called the iron rise of all. Now, this is a problem. Um, again, the, the government of China wanted to have reforms that everybody could get an equal treatment, especially with job opportunities. However, um, the densities of the industries and work-related businesses are just coming from few of the major cities and provinces where um, fluctuations of, of investments were there or are there. Now, most of the people coming from the hinterlands or the places that doesn't really have much of of opportunities are actually going there. You know, there are internal migration and they have surpluses of skilled and work related um, labor. And at some point, um, some of the businesses are actually giving low wages to these um, people because of the surpluses of, of you know, uh, the people that can work in the industries uh, because they're overstaffed, okay? Um, that's why their move is to actually invest and retrench some of their industries from from their major cities or provinces. Like in Beijing, um, that country is one of the hubs of industrial successes in China. However, they should be planning to, to move some of the industries to the other places so that it could equally um, create job opportunities to other uh, to other people living in that area and could probably give them um, equal distribution of the wealth so that every part of China could develop. And that's actually very a very good plan, right? But again, um, it could take a long while. It's because... Um, some of the investments did not really perform well and produce well in the places where it doesn't really give much of, of, of what it needed, right? Okay. Now, we've known how China have evolved and developed and what are their, 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 their glory. Now, let's talk about the challenges that this country um, have faced so far. Now, more recently, the government has struggled to contain the social strife and environmental damage related to economy, the economy's rapid transformation. Now, social strife is because they still have disparity between the rich and the poor, and that cannot be taken out from the scene of the Chinese government. Because again, there are an equal distribution of the wealth. That's why other provinces or other cities are left behind from the major um, industrial cities. It's because uh, none of the most businesses are investing in these places, okay? But the one of the greatest challenges of China today is basically their environment. If you go to Beijing or if you've seen um, reports in Beijing, you'd be able to see that they have problems in their environment. Um, prior to the pandemic, their people there are actually using almost a gas mask for them to breathe because of the smog. Every day, they kept on having this kind of problem, right? And there's this social experiment that when you put a plant outside your uh, your office or probably your your building or your apartment, that plant would not survive because the air is completely polluted. So that's how bad the the environment of of China, especially when we talk about Beijing, right? Um, of course, this can be solved if they try to move some of their industries from other regions so it will spread out, okay? Another one is aside from battling corruption. So even though the communist government is very strict with its rule and policies with regards to corruption, still they have problems with corruption. And they do have quite heavy punishment for the corrupt people. They are actually um, sentenced to death, okay? And there are quite a lot of of reports that some of their government officials who have committed corruption 
have been um, sentenced to death. Okay. Now, um, aside from corruption and other economic crimes, as well as sustaining adequate job growth for tens of millions of workers laid off from state-owned enterprises, migrants and new entrants to the workforce have also been some of the major challenges. Now, at some point, they were having problems with their own job opportunities for, for the people in China to work um, properly. Uh, you know, they have they have tried to, to, to provide policies that everybody could get a decent job. However, another challenge is that they have foreign nationals who are going to China to work and probably taking some of the jobs intended for the Chinese people. And that's one of the challenges that they are facing too. Um, yes. Okay, so from 50 to million or 100 million rural workers were drift between the villages and the cities. Many subsisting through part-time low-paying jobs, although the economic growth has resulted in the creation of a strong middle class, hundreds of millions remain excluded from the benefits and inequalities persist. Correct, right? Again, the policies crafted by the Chinese government to at least give equal opportunities to everybody who are willing and able to work. However, there's no work anymore because again, aside from having a, a, a big population, um, industries are not that, um, don't really have that much of a need for people to work. That's why they have um, people there working low wages or sometimes just part-time low paying jobs. It's because there are plenty of workforce and there's no or not enough um, industries or or businesses that could accommodate this surpluses of of workers, right? Plus another foreign um, um, nationals who are also taking part of the job opportunities in their land. So that's quite of a problem. Though it created um, a strong middle class, but again, there are still millions and hundreds of millions of people living in a very lower um, quality of life. It's because of its instilled inequalities. Okay. Now, now, the large scale and employment in both urban and rural areas in, in changing the price policies remain a source of concern for the government as potential causes of popular resistance. The prices of certain key commodities, especially of industrial raw materials and major industries, industrial products are determined by the state and large subsidies were built into price structure. Again, um, if you are a businessman, if you have a business, and yet um, you are living under China's government rule where they can intervene. And at some point, if you could not really perform well, your business will be taken from you and it will be run by the state. Now, the state, of course, has one and one rule only to, to give equal opportunity to everybody, but they would be paying you very less because that's the rule of the state, right? In the Philippines, um, the lowest bidding contractor would get the the bidding contract it's because um, as much as possible we have to to drift our money in order to use it properly and you know to to, to properly uh, segregate the distribution of wealth in our country and that's it's one of the cases that china also is 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 in concern right now it's because um there are times that businessmen could not or you know business uh, personnels could not really um, generate more and more product because they have lost interest and and lost their their willing to get incentivized by the fact that um, still the government would issue um, just cap on how much wealth you can actually you know get and at some point some of these small and, and medium enterprises are affected to it except for those who are really um, you know, made billions, um, they may not be that effective, but some of the small to medium enterprises are really affected. All right, so in continuation, let's talk about one country, two system policy. Now, in accordance with one country, two system policy, the economies of the former British colony of Hong Kong and Portuguese colony of Macau are separate from the rest of the China and each other. So again, um, this is still monitored by the by the mainland China, but they are given um, quite a different um, setup of its economic or, or market economy 
it's because they were formerly part of of a colonial empire like the Britain and and Portugal so they were given um, ample time to to, to to devise a plan for these uh, former colonies to be really part of the mainland China as of now uh, what we have seen news from uh, from Hong Kong that they are protesting especially when it comes to the policies that the China wanted for the Hong Kong um, you know population so they have been having trouble with protests and a lot of things is going on because China really the mainland wanted to to get as much as control for Hong Kong and even in Macau but as of now the people there are actually trying to to fight back from what they think is uh, suppressive of policies from the mainland China, okay? All right, now, both Hong Kong and Macau are free to conduct and engage in economic negotiations with foreign countries, as well as participate in full members in various international economic organizations. Often under the names Hong Kong, China, and Macau, China, both regions retain their own capitalist economic and political system. So don't forget only Hong Kong and Macau were, you know, given this kind of uh, of of looses or loose ends by the by the Chinese government or the mainland China. It's because they were former colonies of of the Empire of the West, and then some of the values coming from the West were entrenched to them. That's why they kept on on, on, on trying to to protest against the mainland if there are you know, problems or, or there are things that they are not um willing to take from the mainland china it's because the policies are not really that well um yeah all right now four asian tigers aside from japan and china let's talk about the other places in east asia who have reached its its, its success in their economy now the four asian tigers are economies of hong kong singapore south korea and taiwan which underwent rapid industrialization and maintained exceptionally high growth rates in excess of seven percent a year between the 60s and 50s for hong kong and 90s by the 21st century all four had developed into advanced and high income economies specializing in areas of competitive advantage for example hong kong and singapore have become world leading international financial Channel centers, but again, Singapore is not part of um, East Asia. But we are talking now about um, four Asian tigers that have developed over time. And let's just talk about um, Singapore as well, because we can take um, our neighbor as an example on how to develop properly and what are the best practices that they have. Right? Okay, going back again, Hong Kong and Singapore have become the world leading international financial centers, whereas South Korea and Taiwan are world leaders in information technology manufacturing. Their economic success stories have served role models for many developing countries, especially the Tiger Cub economy, which is us, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Okay. Now, export policies have been a de facto reason for the rise of the four Asian Tiger economies. And most especially, the export products that they have are basically coming from its technological advances. Right? If you go to... Uh, south korea samsung is one of the iconic industry that they have there which actually produces you know cell phones and have reached globally okay taiwan is one of the best products of electronics um singapore is one of the best it hubs in the world okay so these are just examples that can be um learned from its neighboring countries just like us okay now, in Hong Kong and Singapore, due to small domestic markets, domestic prices were linked to international prices, correct? That's why if you go to these places, you might be surprised that their prices are quite high. It's because they're, 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 their production there and their entire economy is quite patterned to its international prices, right? Um, South Korea and Taiwan reduce export incentives for the trade goods sector. The government of Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan also work to promote specific exporting industries which were termed as an export push strategy all these policies helped these four nations to achieve growth averaging 7.5 percent each year for three decades and as such they achieved developed country status 
Now, other important aspects, including major government investments in education, uh, take a look at Singapore. They don't have really that much resources because they're just you know small country. But what they have are the people. So they invested in education. They tried to make sure that their people have the kind of knowledge and skills to help their country develop. Non-democratic and relatively authoritarian political system during the early years of development. High levels of U.S. band holdings and high public and private savings. So again, they give emphasis on the things that they don't have in order for them to develop. Okay, now let's talk about the second um, learning objective. Let's talk about how South China has become one of the greatest concern of you know, the 21st century issues concerning territorial disputes, okay? Now, several countries have made competing territorial claims over the South China Sea. As one third of the world's shipping sails through its waters and it is believed to hold huge oil and gas reserves beneath its seabed, turning the territorial disputes into Asia's most potentially dangerous source of conflict. Again, there are two things that we have to consider why this is one of the best spot and why it is being um, in conflict with with the countries lying within this sea right first is that it's one of the world's shipping sales where most of the products are actually going back and forth uh, traversing the seas second is this is um, known to have oil reserves right so there are a lot of potential resources that the countries who are claiming the South China Sea could actually get from. Problem is, China has overruled all of the claims of the other countries and actually put what, from what we know now, as the nine dash line, right? It's a line that the Chinese government has actually issued that all of the line inside this is actually part of the South China Sea and it affected the Philippines, the Vietnam, even Thailand from this claim. And what happened was are almost um, confrontations of each of the countries between China. And that's very concerning. Okay, now, here are the key points why we have to understand the conflict in, in the South China Sea, right? Now, South China Sea is a marginal sea encompassing an area from um, Karimata and Malacca Straits of the Strait of Taiwan. Uh, to the state of Taiwan. The sea is located south China, east of Vietnam, in Cambodia, northwest of the Philippines, um, east of Malay Peninsula, and Sumatra, up to the Strait of Malacca in the west, and the north of Bangka Betong Island and Borneo. One third of the world's shipping sails through its waters, and it's believed this, uh, to hold this huge amount of oil reserve. Okay? Now, several countries have made competing territorial claims over South China Sea. These disputes have been seen as Asia's most potentially dangerous point of conflict. Both China and Taiwan claim almost entire body of their own, um, demarcating their claims within what is known as the Nine Dash Line. Competing claims over parts of the area include Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Brunei, Malaysia, Cambodia, and Thailand. Right? The area may be rich in oil and natural gas deposits, although estimates vary. The once abundant fishing opportunities within the region are another motivation for claims because it actually holds one of the best coral reefs in the region. And at the same time, it has produced quite an amount of, of fishing uh, products in that area. And our um, Filipino fisher folks are, have been fishing in these lands or in these waters, sorry. However, Changes over time um, were very, very conflicting and very alarming. It's because China doesn't want our fisher folks to really go and fish to the uh, fishing grounds where we used to claim, right? And this has caused quite a large amount of the GDP of the country. It's because there are no enough product anymore to be pay, to be to be to be taken from this um, sea. So that's quite of a problem. And I think it's very synonymous with the other um, countries in Southeast Asia that are claiming this uh, part of the sea, okay? All right, now, 
The once abundant fishing opportunities within the region is another claim. According to the studies of Department of Environmental Resources in the Philippines, the body of water holds one third of the entire world marine biodiversity, making it as a very important area of the ecosystem. Finally, the area is one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. Again, busiest shipping routes. Now imagine if China would occupy the sea and then they will impose um, taxes to weather or to wherever you know, the products would come past through this island. This would give a boost again to the economy of, of China. And that's very concerning, especially from, um, from us and from other countries not uh, in the U.S. or in the European unions, because this doesn't really um, give much um, to the places if there's one country who are claiming it. Okay. All right. Now, China and Vietnam have both been vigorous in prosecuting their claims. The Association of Southeast Asian Nation General and Malaysia in particular have been keen to ensure that the territorial disputes within the South China Sea did not escalate into armed conflicts. That is right. Joint development authorities have been set up in areas of overlapping claims to jointly develop the area and divide the profits equally. Uh, without set, uh, settling the issues of RINPI, generally China has preferred to resolve competing claims bilaterally, while some ASEAN countries prefer multilateral talks. Well, the Philippines um, have, have been having um, bilateral talks with China. So far, we don't get much of a result that would benefit the Philippines, right? Aside from, from um, getting favors from China when we ask them to loan you know, quite a lot of money where the government is actually doing. But besides um, that, our claim in the South China Sea as part of our exclusive economic zone is not given any attention from Beijing. So that's quite a, um, an issue that needs to be uh, really taken and, 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 and seriously um, studied well because we don't also want to go to war, but what we can do is to, to have a diplomatic talks with them. That's, it's one of the best things that we can do, right? We can protest and in, in claiming our own or our in claiming what we know our own. Okay. Now, in 2011, China attempted to keep India away from the South China Sea waters and protested Indian Vietnamese cooperation in the oil sector. Um, again, um, this has resolved. It's because uh, they don't want to go to, 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 to war with, with China. Uh, same with the other countries who um, have claimed it. Okay. Now, the United States and China currently in disagreement over South China Sea. The U.S. State Department voiced support for fair access by reiterating that freedom of navigation and respect of international law are a matter of national interest to the United States. So again, um, why the U.S. Um, insisting that the waters are actually free for everybody. It's because when China would like to impose things there, um, it would limit um, the, the production of, of many countries because, again, this area is one of the busiest um, area for sea transportation, right? And now it's being um, controlled and it gave limitations to those um, um, vessels that will traverse this area. And that's quite alarming. Now, the position of China and its maritime claims based on UNCLOS and history has been ambiguous, particularly with the Nine Dash Line map. China has also reportedly indicated that the Chinese government claims um, drawn on historical basis, but the vast majority of international legal experts have concluded that China's claims based on historical claims are invalid. But we have not prevented China from actually occupying the South China Sea, and we have not prevented them from building um, artificial land in that area. So now China has one of, of, of the ground reason why they could not give away the South China Sea because they already stayed, uh, you know, placed something there. Okay. The last part is let's talk about the two Koreas today. What's been happening to the countries of North and South Korea? How much they have talked about having peaceful resolution to their conflicts? And what are some of the challenges that they are facing today? Okay. 
Now, we've already known that tensions between South and North Korea continue to escalate as the countries never signed a peace treaty after the Korean War, and thus formally remain at war, with each incident potential triggering a military conflict. Up until today, they doesn't really have much standing laws that would prevent them from going to war. Of course, the United Nations demarcated um, the 38th parallel where it's a neutral zone between the North and the South Korea. And most of the time, talks between the North and South Korea are done usually in the 38th parallel, okay? Or the demilitarized zone. Now next, in 1998, South Korean President Kim Dae-jung announced the so-called sunshine policy towards North Korea. The main aim of this policy is to soften North Korea's attitude towards the South by encouraging interaction and economic assistance. But there were little attempt by the North to do so, right? That's why um, they are still on, on the verge of, of really getting into war. It's because of this... Um, of, of, of the adamant attitude of the North Korean to accept at least um, a peaceful resolution between them. Okay, There were quite a lot of attempts, but North Koreans don't really much care about it. Um, in 2000, the first inter-Korean summit between Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-il took place. It's the father of Kim Jong-un, who is the current leader now of the, South Korea, uh, of the North Korea. As a result, Kim Dae-jung was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It is because of his efforts to at least resolve conflicts of the two Koreas and its, it, its stronger values to make a peace to whatever you know, conflict that they have before in the Korean Wars. But there are, again, a very little development on the attempts of Kim Dae-jung and the rest of South Korea to make uh, you know, men's if there are mended hearts or if there are... Um, um, broken hearts in in the part of the North Korea. Okay. Now, in June 15, North South joint declaration, the two leaders signed during the first South North summit stated that they would hold the second summit at appropriate time. It was originally in the Saj that the second summit would be held in South Korea, but that did not materialize. In 2007, South Korean President Ru Mu Yoon and North Korean leader Kim Jong Il signed. The peace declaration, the document called for international talks to replace the armistice that ended the Korean War with a permanent peace treaty. But again, this was not materialized. It was just presented. Both were actually you know, seeking guidance and counsels on how to do it. But the peace declaration uh, that they have signed did not really materialize at all. In 2008, the new president of the South, Lee myung bak and his Grand National Party took a different stance up to North Korea. And the South Korean government stated that any expansion of the economic cooperation of the Kaishong International Region would only happen if the North resolved the international standoff over its nuclear weapons. So that steer another um, conflict or another aggression by the North when you know the South Koreans tried to demand something that they should delimit, demilitarize their country, especially by not producing any nuclear weapons at all. But the North did not give in to the demands of the South Korea and will never ever sign any peace treaty uh, at that time. Okay. Now in 2010, South Korean Unification Ministry officially declared the sunshine policy a failure, thus bringing it to an end. Because even though both parties signed the North and the South, but they weren't really cooperating at all, especially you know, when we talk about the North, they're very suspicious about the plans of the South Koreans. You know, for the South, South Koreans in defense, trying to, to make sure that the, the country and its people will be protected from its aggression of its of their neighbor, you know, the North Korea. So there were several attempts from 1998 until 2010 to resolve conflicts. But again, um, this, the, these attempts of peaceful negotiation uh, did not really materialize at all, and it ended as a failure. Um, and then put to an end by both parties. Now, in 2011, the Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, died uh, from a heart attack. His youngest son, Kim Jong-un, was announced as his successor. Under Kim Jong-un, North Korea has continued to develop nuclear weapons. In 2016, Kim Jong-un stated that North Korea would not use nuclear weapons first unless aggressive hostile forces used nuclear weapons to invade 
on our sovereignty. That's what the Kim, um, I mean, what Kim Jong Un stated, right? However, on other occasions, North Korea has threatened preemptive nuclear attacks against U.S. led attack. Kim Jong Un. Um, extreme human rights abuses and food insecurity remain major issues in North Korea, right? Because all of their money are actually invested um, in, or almost all of their money invested in, in military um, preparations, right? Nuclear weapons, any kind of armaments that they have or they wanted to create, they have that. However, leaving behind the country economically poor and, you know, the ma majority of the Korean people are having problems with their with their food and and the health securities because they don't have much nothing really there right now over the last years several incidents have contributed to the growing tensions between south korea and north korea including sinking a south korean ship caused by north korean torpedo north korea launched a scientific and technological satellite that reached orbit in north korea planting um, a mine that went off the korean demilitarized zone wounding two South Korean soldiers. So up until today, they are still in constant battle with one another, trying to defeat with one another and trying to impose something which both countries do not really want to do so. Okay. Now, um, the pending of talks has been um, quite of, of, of an alarming concern because... Um, North Korea did not give in to, to any of the demands coming from the U.S. or even South Korea. They still keep on developing things and could potentially be a threat to South Korea in no time, right? As long as there are um, countries who have plans to, to, to really create uh, a weapon, weapon of mass destruction, then South Korea will never have peace of mind, okay? All right, so that's about it. Um, everything that we talk about for East Asia, these are things that we have not or have not included in your module. So these are things that needed to be at least highlighted because it's important concerns and issues that would benefit also the Filipinos and other Southeast Asian nations because we have been learning from the success stories of our neighboring countries like the East Asian countries. All right, so... Um, that's the end of our discussion. Um, let me just minimize this and end my um, presentation so we can go back to you know, this one. Um, so, okay, um, if you have questions from this discussion, please don't forget to just comment below in, in our YouTube channel. Um, I'll get to you as soon as possible or just you know comment your name there for attendance okay um i will see you next week for our um online sync for and 